Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another study in God's Word. We're making our way through the book of Acts and almost concluded. We're in the last chapter today, Acts 28, studies in the book of Acts, and we start today at Acts 28 and verse 17. Acts 28, verse 17, if you want to read along. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, Though I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go, because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called to you, to, called for you to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. So here we get to the final dialogue that Paul's going to have in the book of Acts, and it's going to bring us ultimately to the conclusion of the book. It's very interesting that again, after all this time, all the evangelism, all the traveling, all the preaching in various cities, Paul ends up in Rome, and who are the first people he wants to see? It's the Jewish leaders. The Jewish community is on his heart. And, of course, he later would speak about his love for the Jewish people, that he would carefully affirm in Romans, I am an Israelite. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. We know in his testimony in Philippians 3, he didn't deny those credentials that he had. And what's more, he would say that he could wish himself accursed for his brethren according to the flesh who are uh, from Israel. And so he had a deep and abiding love for the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. And it reminds us of that principle he enunciates in Romans 1.16, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So the Lord wants to save Jewish people. The Bible is not an anti-Semitic book. And where people have tried to use it to bolster anti-Semitism, they are perverting scripture. They're ignoring the fact that ethnically our Lord was a Jew, according to his humanity, that all of his early apostles were Jews, that the church at the beginning of the book of Acts is majority Jewish. And in course of time, it's true that the Gentiles responded more to the gospel than the Jewish community. But that doesn't mean that God stopped or has stopped now in our day loving the Jewish people and wanting to save them. We remember John 3.16 famously says, For God so loved the world. So it's wonderful that that encompasses every stripe of humanity, every ethnic distinction, and every um, thing that human beings would use to divide one another, where we hear so much today about racism, and we hear about class, and we hear about economics, and we hear about oppression, and so forth. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is an equal opportunity savior, and he wants to save high and low, small and great, uh, every stripe, every color, every hue of humanity, uh, wherever they come from on the earth, whatever their heart language, whatever is true about them, the Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that's the one thing that we all have in common, whatever else may be different, we can say we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what God's word says about us. Romans 3.23. We're all sinners. And the soul that sins, it shall die, the Bible tells us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23. And the Lord came to save us from our sins. To save us from the penalty that those sins deserve. That is, enduring the wrath of God for eternity in the lake of fire. He also came to save us from the power of sins, from being living in addictions, being living slaves to vices and to uh, perverted thinking and to all kinds of evil thoughts and evil deeds, not to mention evil words. And the Lord came to destroy the works of the devil. That's what 1 John 3 tells us. And so he's a comprehensive savior, who wants to save us from the penalty and the power of sin. And ultimately, of course, the Bible says the gospel is, is a message of salvation, a complete salvation, because the Lord wants to save us from the very presence of sin, that when he comes to receive his people to himself, he will transform us. Our bodies will be changed like unto his glorious body, 
and will be fit to be in the Lord's presence for all eternity. So it's truly a wonderful saving gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, how any sinner from any background, from any kind of place, wherever you hail from, there is no wrong side of the tracks for the gospel. The Lord's grace can reach even you. And there's an old Christian song, God's grace reaches farther than sin could ever go. And Romans enunciates that idea. It says where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Or I like the translation that says grace super abounded. So Christ is the savior of sinners. Christ is the savior for you and for me. <coughs> Pardon me. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures so that we could be saved. And the Lord doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want you to go on being lost, neither in this life nor to be eternally lost uh, when the age to come arrives. So the Lord wants to save you. And you can be saved by repenting, turning from yourself and your sin and agreeing with God. I'm a sinner. I'm justly condemned. I deserve hell. I deserve the lake of fire. But I see that the Lord Jesus is the Savior of sinners. So you can turn to the Lord and then put your faith in him. In other words, you entrust yourself to him and say, Lord, I'm throwing myself on your mercy. <clears throat> I'm not trusting in my works, in any supposed good deeds or merit I have, in any religion I'm identified with, in any church building, synagogue, mosque, or what have you that I may attend. There's no human temple. There's no pathway devised by men. There's no philosophy or worldview that can save. Christ is the Savior. We must come to him, the Lord Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us and died for the on the cross for us and rose again to give us the gift of eternal life. And if we receive salvation, it's all of grace. It's God giving us what we don't deserve. And it's there for the asking. The Lord said, Whosoever cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. So if you feel the Lord is drawing you today, you realize you're a sinner, you're burdened. You don't have to do anything other than call out to God to save you. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Or as Romans 10 and 9 famously puts it, if we shall confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Uh, you will be saved, it says. So it's a tremendous promise and a great gospel message we have. Now, Paul wanted to get that message to the Jewish leaders. And in keeping with his policy that wherever he went in his apostolic ministry, the first thing he did was he tried to connect with the Jewish community. That led him to a prayer meeting, you recall, by the river in Philippi in Acts 16, where he met some women. And that led him to various synagogues in Antioch of Pisidia in Acts 13, or in Thessalonica in Acts 17, or Berea, same chapter. Uh, ultimately, wherever there were Jews, Paul would try to go and tell them about their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how Messiah had come into the world and made a way of salvation because as John the Baptist, the great forerunner, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way the Lord said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Paul likewise wanted to point them to the Lord. Now, this section we've read in Acts 28 is an interesting example of divine diplomacy or spirit-led ministering in the gospel and, and being a Christian gentleman, we might say. You know, sometimes we think we've got to be like the proverbial bull in the china shop. We just have to say, full speed ahead, darn the torpedoes and all that kind of thing, you know. Let me just go in there and uh, tell people, get right in their face and tell them uh, what the problem is, that they're sinners and they need a savior. Well, that's an incontrovertible part of the gospel and we need to tell the bad news so that the good news may be appreciated. But Paul's careful in his approach, as he always was. He's trying to win the person over. There's persuasion involved here. It's not just preaching the gospel and the power of the Spirit that's vital, but the Spirit leads to persuasion, that as he's going to speak with them, he's trying to convince them. And, of course, doesn't want to raise their hackles right off the gate, you know, and kind of make them feel antagonistic. They probably 
had their misgivings already, although we find out later they're more wide open than one would expect. But after three days, Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. And so when they came together, he said to them, men and brethren. Now that was a Semiticism. That was a careful, um, a common way rather, that Jewish people addressed one another. And you can see Peter and the other apostles using that kind of address earlier in the book of Acts. It's not teaching that we're all spiritual brothers and sisters according to the brotherhood of man. In other words, by the first creation, uh, we are not all brethren in a spiritual family of God. To become a child of God, John 1.12 is quite clear, we have to receive him, the Lord Jesus Christ. To as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to become the children of God, it says. So to become part of God's spiritual family, you have to be born again. And born again people, people that have been born from above and given that new life in Christ, which he described as eternal life, eternal both in quality and in duration, of course, the Lord makes us part of a spiritual family. And so it's quite natural and common in Acts and the epistles for believers to refer to each other as brother and sister. But here he was recognizing the kinship of natural ties. Now, the same way that Italian Americans or Mexican Americans or German Americans or African Americans or Asian Americans of one description or another might approach one another and see a commonality because they come out of common ethnic stock. They come from a similar culture. They come from the same language group. And so this men and brethren is more or less a polite form of address to begin the conversation. It's not a spiritual statement that, oh, they're already saved people. They're very clearly not saved. That's the reason he's calling them, so that they can come to know the Lord. He says, though I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. So he's got to explain why he's there, what's going on, why is this trial happening. And it's all because of uh, how he was treated there in Jerusalem and that he was handed over to the Romans by the Jews. Of course, being delivered, it's the same sort of phraseology that was used uh, regarding what they did with the Lord Jesus, how the Sanhedrin delivered the Lord Jesus to Pontius Pilate to be crucified. And here Paul has been delivered as well. But it's interesting that there's no bitterness or rancor against Jews themselves or against Israel. That Paul's not a self-loathing Jew, nor is he mad at his brethren according to the flesh. He's not angry with his fellow Jews, nor does he impugn guilt to the whole nation of Israel. I mean, that old, um, terrible, racist assertion that Jewish people are Christ killers just doesn't have basis in fact with how the New Testament speaks of the crucifixion. Were Jews involved at the crucifixion? Absolutely. They delivered him up to be crucified. Were Gentiles involved? Absolutely. They carried forward the Gentiles. But really, we can ask, why was the Lord Jesus Christ crucified? He was crucified for sinners, for Jewish sinners, and for Gentile sinners, which, folks, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So that encompasses everybody, every human being. We're all in the same boat. We're all under that sentence of condemnation. And the Lord Jesus died for all of us. He was on that cross because of our sins. So, uh, you know, one of our modern hymns says, Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until he was accomplished. Notice that. My sin. And, and we sing in an older song, My sins, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, has, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Mr. Horatio Spafford taking the word pictures from Colossians 2 and weaving that into his wonderful hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, which has been a comfort and a help to so many believers. Now, Paul's not going to slam Israel. Rather, he wants to call these men together to dispel confusion and to make it clear that this is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is all about the claims of Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Son of Man, the Messiah promised in the Old Testament, the Savior of sinners. 
and also the Son of God, the Eternal One, who's always existed and yet stepped into time as a man to become the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we'll unpack this discussion further in the next few lessons. Thank you for listening.